Well, welcome to another episode of the uh, podcast. Um, we actually have a guest um, with us today, a Tom Farr, originally from Canada, now in South Africa, who recently received his PhD in statistics. So congrats on that, um, Tom. I've been looking forward to this interview for a while. Um, as some on the blog know, I have a interest in the Christadelphian movement, a Unitarian restorationist movement from the 19th century. Um, and Tom actually used to be a member of the Unamended Christadelphians, um, and he's written quite a bit on Satan and demons and other issues. So um, before we kind of delve into the topic, uh, Tom, thank you again for coming on to this podcast. I really do appreciate it. Thanks, Robert. It's good to be with you today. Um, now, before we kind of delve into the topic, uh, perhaps if you were to give a brief introduction to yourself, like what's your religious background, um, when did you become Catholic, and also what's your academic background as well, a anything you want to discuss. Okay, thanks. Um, so I'm, as you mentioned, I'm Canadian born, and I've been living in South Africa for the past 15 years, currently in Cape Town. Um, I'm married with a stepson and a uh, a child on the way. I don't know yet if it's a son or a daughter. Um, Congrats, by the way. Then, ac thank you. <laughs> um, academically speaking, um, yes, as you said, I studied statistics as my main discipline, and that's also my my day job is as a an academic in the field of statistics. Um, now, coming to the religious background, as you said, I was raised as a Christadelphian. Um, a, a fairly devout Christadelphian family um, in the unamended fellowship, uh, which is one of the subgroups, you could say, within Christadelphians. And that was my life for the first uh, couple of decades. Uh, I was baptized as a Christadelphian at the age of 17 and um, became kind of like a budding Christadelphian apologist. That was sort of the early days of the internet so i created a website as as one would do at the time and i was also active in a lot of um, online discussion forums that was kind of before the the days of social media so i think discussion forums were a, a big way of interacting with other people on the internet and discussing ideas so i got into that and um that continued for some time and over time as i as i read more uh, and, and reflected more on theology i came to question um, some of the doctrinal teachings of christadelphians and the the topic of satan and demons was really the one that really i, I first started to question whether the christadelphian understanding was biblical and true and through that and other doctrines that I also questioned and rethought, um, I came to view myself more as an evangelical over time. And I was fellowshipping in kind of a Pentecostal type of church for a while, and then uh, in a Baptist church for a couple of years. So this was kind of in the 2010s. And then um, in 2016, I started the RCIA program a right for Christian Christian initiation of adults, which is how an adult, you know, becomes a Catholic or explores becoming a Catholic. That's a one-year process. And then at Easter 2017, I was received into the Catholic Church. I was also baptized and confirmed um, because the Catholic Church doesn't recognize Christadelphian baptism as valid. So that's why I had to be baptized. And I've been a, a Catholic since then. I'm active in co-teaching the RCIA class in, in my parish with the parish deacon. Um, and uh, I did do a degree in theology along the way um, through the, it was through King's Evangelical Divinity School in the UK, but it's affiliated with the University of Chester. Um, I never actually set foot on any of the campuses. It was all distance learning, but that kind of coincided with my journey through evangelicalism and into the Catholic Church. Um, and I've, uh, as you say, I've written a few things on Satan and demons, including about four or five uh, published 
scholarly articles. Well, uh, thanks for that background. I appreciate it. And in the show notes, I will link to Tom's uh, website, his blog, his Academia EDU website as well. What I'll also do is I will be linking to Swan Sona's um, intellectual Catholicism page because Tom has actually appeared a few times now on it discussing the Holy Spirit and Christology, his conversion to Catholicism, as well as a uh, video on Satan and demons, uh, which is actually the topic today. So um, I'll also include uh, my interview with Dave Burke, who I think we can both agree is like uh, one of the uh, best uh, contemporary cursed Adelphian apologists. Um, we actually had a very good conversation a year and a half ago where he gave an overview of uh, Christadelphian theology. Um, he and these uh, trend Jonathan, I think, are actually probably the best uh, Cal Christadelphian apologists um, online, at least. Anyway, uh, I think you would agree with me uh, on that assessment as well. But um, yeah, so uh, this would be like a... A, uh, using Swanstone as interview with your good self on Satan and Demons and just like um, maybe answering uh, perhaps common, usually Christadelphian uh, arguments about Satan and Demons. Uh, but maybe before we do that, like um, if you were to put on your old Christadelphian hat for a moment, um, how would you define the Christadelphian understanding of Satan and Demons? Because like in the BASF and the, um, the Birmingham amended and an amended statement of faith, doctrine 11 to be rejected is simply uh, to reject is that the devil is a supernatural person. Uh, I'm working from memory. Um, but it's a bit more nuanced than that. So um, it, could you briefly describe, like, say, the um, an informed Christadelphian understanding of Satan and demons? Um, sure. Um, so as you mentioned, the, the most commonly used Christadelphian statement of faith, the BASF, um, only mentions the devil to reject a particular idea about the devil, which is that the devil is a supernatural personal being, or maybe it just says personal being. Um, so it doesn't actually say then what the positive understanding of what the devil is, because Christadelphians, of course, uh, study their Bibles closely and know their Bibles very well. And so they are well aware that there are terms such as ha diabolos um, which is usually translated as the devil in the, the new testament as well as ha satanas which is usually translated satan um, they're also well aware that there are um, accounts particularly in the synoptic gospels um, accounts of jesus performing what seem to be exorcisms and the terminology like demon possessed uh is used in the greek um and so they are aware that this material exists in scripture and so it comes down to the hermeneutics um that are used and so generally speaking when it comes to the devil um christadelphians will take a figurative interpretation of the terminology and say that this is a term um, a personification of evil if you like um, it's a term to describe the, the sort of sum total of human sin in a metaphorical way um, sometimes satan is sort of um, separated from the devil and interpreted a bit differently one will often encounter the idea that the word satan simply means adversary and therefore the, the immediate context will determine what kind of adversary is in view. It could be the devil, like the figurative personification of sin as a particular adversary, but in another context, it might be another adversary. Um, then coming to demons, I think demons are generally treated almost as a separate topic from, uh, from the devil. Um, of course, they'll often be treated together just because uh, the rest of Christendom views views them as related. But um, Christadelphians don't don't generally apply the sort of figurative personification uh, hermeneutic to references to demons in the New Testament. Um, generally speaking, in the Synoptic Gospels the idea of accommodation is brought in where demon demon possessed people are actually suffering from mental illness as modern science would recognize 
but um, because the New Testament was written in a pre-scientific age, um, the writers, well, you either the Holy Spirit in inspiring the biblical writers um, accommodates their, you know, pre-scientific understanding of these phenomena and allows them to use the terminology that was current at the time, but without intending for us uh, today to understand it that way. But I would give the caveat that um, mo I don't. I think most Christadelphians would say that even the New Testament writers did not believe in literal demons. Like they understood, they themselves were accommodating perhaps their audience, but you know Matthew, Mark, and Luke did not actually believe in demons. Most Christadelphians, I think, would would make that claim. And then I think other references to demons in the New Testament such as in, in 1 Corinthians 10, uh, will often be interpreted as a synonym for idols or false gods. So in other words, entities that don't actually exist have any ontological existence. So I think that's, in a nutshell, that's, I think, how Christadelphians regard Satan and demons uh, biblically. No, thanks for that. Um, I think that's a good view because I remember like a few years ago, I read a book, which you're familiar with, uh, Watkins' book, The Devil, The Great Deceiver. And in the book, he basically said, and this is directed to also Christadelphians, like, no, Christadelphians do believe in Satan, demons and devils. We just understand it differently because uh, one, I often hear this from Anthony Buzzard, who's like a very well-informed Unitarian um, author. I know you're friends with him, but sometimes when he presents on uh christadelphian issues he basically says well uh christadelphians don't believe in the devil they just believe that you are de uh, the devil and it has to be a bit more nuanced than that but and that's good um for those who may be interested like the most sustained book so far from a pro christadelphian perspective is duncan heaster h-e-a-s-t-e-r he's booked a real devil um Duncan sent me a free copy about a decade ago. It's also available online. Um, and Tom has actually interacted quite a bit with his book and other Christadelphian works on his website and uh, blog. So if anyone wants to see like the other side of the coin, I think so far that's the best book. Although I've been told Jonathan Burke is working on a uh, book on the topic as well. So um, that should be interesting. So uh, perhaps if we were to like um, discuss like a few of the issues, of course, we can't be exhaustive in an interview like this, but if we were to maybe touch upon like say some of the common objections and evidences for Satan and demons, like the traditional view and the Christadelphian view. Um, one, one text that's often used by both sides or one incident in the life of Jesus um, that's used by both sides is the temptation of Christ in the wilderness. Um, you have that in Matthew chapter four, verses one to 11, a very terse account in Mark 1, 12 to 13, and also Luke 4, 1 to 13 as well. Um, now, the Christadelphian view is, well, although it's maybe presented as a historical narrative, it's actually myth, uh, mythological, not like make-believe, but like uh, symbolic language being used to describe an event in the life of Christ. And the tempter, although he's presented as external, some, not all Christadelphians believe this, he's just simply an external personification of Christ's sinful tendencies or sinful nature, his human nature. Um, and some Christadelphians might appeal to what's called the Yetzer Hara, the evil or inclination or the evil impulse. And in their view, in some te Jewish texts, this evil impulse is personified uh, as a person. Um, uh, is there anything else you would like to address so we don't strum in the uh, Christadelphian understanding of that? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I would say that um, I think Jonathan Burke's um, treatment of the, the temptations in the wilderness is a little bit, is probably more, I would use the term sophisticated and complex also than um, more traditional Christadelphian treatment of this text. Um, Firstly, the earliest Christadelphians, uh, John Thomas, the founder of the movement, and his protege, Robert Roberts, um, they actually both interpreted the temptation narratives to mean that Jesus was tempted by another human. So they understand the tempter in the passage to refer to an, a personal being, but not a supernatural personal being. 
Uh, subsequent to that, the view arise, and I think became dominant, that um, this is this is a, a figurative account of Jesus' um, inner struggle, and so the devil perhaps refers to a um, you know an aspect of his psyche, if you want to use sort of project modern psychological categories back you could in, come up with a psychological interpretation that Jesus is struggling with temptation within his own mind and heart and um, the devil is is a way of describing that voice within him that's suggesting to him that he do the wrong thing um, the reason why I say Jonathan Burke's interpretation is a bit more sophisticated is because he brings in uh, issues of genre um, he he brings in the category of midrash and so on to to try to make a sort of textual argument um, in the context of second temple judaism that this is a plausible interpretation but yeah that's i think that's the basic idea of the christadelphian interpretation yeah, and I think some Christadelphians might appeal to Jesus being on the mount and being able to see the entire world. And some Christadelphians believe this is like the entire world. Um, and of course, there's no mountain like that. So they might appeal, like, say, to apocalyptic literature to buttress that uh, claim, I believe. So um, in light of this, why do you think that? And I know I should note you actually have a very good paper on this on your uh, website. But what would you say in response to that? Why should one interpret this figure, one being an external figure, to some type of supernatural Satan figure? And three, what are the um, exegetical problems with the Christadelphian uh, perspective in light of its context? Okay. Um, yeah, I have a, an article on my blog. I'm not sure if it's the one you're referring to, but it it's called Who Tempted Jesus in the Wilderness? 10 points to ponder and i think um if one goes through the those 10 points um they're basically they basically amount to 10 arguments that um jesus is interacting with an external supernatural being or at least that's how the the gospel writers understand the the in, the encounter that's how they present it um it's perhaps it, it's a different question for the theologian uh, whether we should understand the, the devil the same way that the gospel writers do, that comes to issues of not only inerrancy, but um, theological interpretation. Should we, um, are, are we being naive in a scientific age if we uh, accept at face value the, the worldview of the New Testament writers? So that's kind of a separate theological question and that's where i think a lot of um contemporary biblical scholars and theologians might appear to be on the same page as christadelphians in certain respects but um in fact are not really because they're generally agreeing with the traditional interpretation in terms of the exegesis of what how the new testament writers understood this figure of the devil but they are then um saying that we can't theologically we can't really accept that because of our scientific view of the world and therefore we are compelled to demythologize the devil okay that's gone off on a bit of a tangent there but um coming back to the passage itself um the, the 10 points in a nutshell the first one is that the genre of the gospels in narrative and so this account, if we say that it's something other than narrative, it becomes kind of a fish out of water with respect to the rest of the, the Gospels, because all the other accounts, you know, of course, you have parables that Jesus tells within the, the Gospel narratives, but those are easily distinguishable within the text. There, there's nothing about the way the account of the temptation is introduced that differs from how other narratives are introduced or suggest that it's a parable. So um, 
it, it's it just appears to be a narrative at, at a straightforward reading of the text. Um, the second point I made is is about the importance of of Mark's account. Um, you know, M Mark's account is regarded by most biblical scholars to be earlier than Matthew and Luke and to have been used by Matthew and Luke as a source. Um, and Mark's account is very laconic and doesn't uh, create much room for, you know, fanciful interpretations of a, you know, a psychological kind of event, because it just very briefly states that Jesus was in the wilderness being tempted by Satan, and then it mentions wild beasts and so on. So there isn't much space for the sort of interpreter's imagination to play. Um, the third point is that, uh, and this is one that um, Anthony Buzzard makes pr prominent, and, and I think it was through Anthony Buzzard that I first became aware of this about 20 years ago, um, is that in the Greek, the accounts consistently use the definite article, and so they're speaking of ha diabolos, ha satanas, the devil, the Satan, not just a devil or a Satan. And that, that I think, is basically fatal to the interpretation of uh, John Thomas, for instance, that this was an unnamed human being that was tempting uh, Jesus, because if that's the case, why is he introduced with the definite article as the devil or if you want to if you don't want to inter translate as the devil it could be like the um calumniator or the the enemy the false accuser the slanderer whatever term you want to use but it's still the so if if it says jesus was tempted by the slanderer um if we read that in english we would be immediately asked well what slanderer because the author is implying that it's like a well-known slander that the reader will be familiar with, but this figure has not previously been introduced in the text. And so I think that's that's a serious problem with the with the older Christadelphian interpretation. But I think even with the the figurative interpretation, um, the the presence of the definite article suggests that the author is introducing a well-known figure uh, like a well-known idea and so if you're going to argue that um, this well-known figure is actually a metaphorical idea or a personification the question is where where does that idea come from because the author is seems to be assuming that the readers are already familiar with that this idea so we we can't really use this text to establish the idea because the authors treat it as a well-known idea that the readers are already familiar with. Um, the fourth reinforces what I said about the, the, the genre being narrative. You know, it's, um it's introduced the same way so many other stories in the gospel are introduced where someone will come up to jesus and say something to him and here we have a figure called the devil or diabolos coming up to jesus and saying something to him so if we're going to interpret consistently within the gospels then um, i think it's it's not very easy to argue that this is a completely different kind of event than all the other occasions where someone comes up to Jesus and and says something that this is in fact not a person but a figurative encounter. Um, I, the internet connection is a bit. Spotty. Yeah, it, it went down for a second, but you're okay. Still... Um, uh, one of the other Do points you bring up. Oh, no, no, it, it, it's fine. But like uh, one of the other points you bring up, and I think it's a very good one, you and others bring up, that this figure is external, is the use of pros Um, You know, pros is use of this figure 
but it's also used of the good angel angels who actually comfort Jesus after his temptation. Now, Christadelphians, while they don't believe uh, in fallen angels and so forth, they think it's an impossibility. They do believe like elect or righteous angels exist, and these righteous external angels, prosyrkamide, to put the Greek, to Jesus. So do you think uh, it's a very good argument? And I already know the answer, but um, that prosyrkamide is used of both the devil or the tempter in this pericope, as well as the external angels as well. In fact, you just uh, took point number five out of my mouth because uh, that was about the fact that the you know the account says the devil left and angels came. So Christadelphians will agree that when it says angels came, these are personal being supernatural personal beings arriving. And so when it says the devil came and the devil left, we have to now bifurcate and say. The same text in the same immediate context is using coming and going language of transcendent personal beings. But then when it uses the same language of the devil, it's a completely different meaning. It's it's figurative, uh, which I which I think is real is not consistent. Um, then of course there's the the notion that the accounts feature dialogue between a person and what would be a personification. Um, if we accept the Christadelphian interpretation, which I think is just rather bizarre. Um, you would have to deny that any actual dialogue took place if um, the devil is not in fact a person. Um, because dialogue is a conversation between two persons. And even in the, and I think that goes beyond any of the biblical uh, passages that are used to support the notion of personification. I mean, sure, personification does occur in the Bible. No one would deny that. But if you look at accounts um, that have a really heightened sense of personification, like in Lady Wisdom in Proverbs, for example, uh, or the, the foot uh, talking to the hand in, in 1 Corinthians 12, um, there's not like an extended back and forth between two entities in these accounts like there is in the temptation narrative it's sort of a either a a monologue in the case of uh, lady wisdom in proverbs or just a very brief kind of remark from one entity to the other like if the foot um if the foot says to the hand i have no need of you in in corinthians something like that so the, the fact that we have this ex extended back and forth dialogue between Jesus and the devil, um, it it really stretches the notion that this could be personification based on other biblical passages where personification does occur. Um, the, seventh, the seventh point is that both Matthew and Luke's accounts describe a physical act of worship that is demanded by the devil to Jesus. They use slightly different uh, language to do so. So in Matthew, the devil literally says, if falling down, you would worship me, um, using the verb pipto, which means to fall down. And in, in Luke, um, the devil asks Jesus to worship before me, which again, in the, the preposition before there implies a physical act of obeisance and this doesn't really make any sense if this is an inner struggle because there is no there is in that case no one for jesus to actually fall down before in obeisance um the eighth point is that the um the language in in the temptation narrative can be recognized in terms of Roman law as um, wh where the devil shows Jesus all the kingdoms of the world. Um, th this was a normal practice when property was being transacted that the, the seller and the buyer will actually go together to see the land that is being sold and kind of walk through it. And uh, that was necessary in terms of the law for the for the property to be transferred. So 
if we if we're familiar with Roman law, we will understand that that is kind of what the devil is doing here. He's taking Jesus on a visual tour of the land that he's offering to transact to him. And again, I, I don't think the notion of a property transaction makes any sense unless there's two parties present in this case. Um, then the, 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 the ninth point is that, you know, the devil makes quite an extended pitch, particularly in Luke's version, um, where he says, to you, I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. And I think that this pitch makes perfect sense if the devil is a personal being who's trying to persuade Jesus that he is capable of delivering on his offer. But if this dialogue is actually an internal struggle in Jesus' mind, this is a very odd line because um, Jesus wouldn't need to sort of sell the idea to himself that he has authority. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it reads more as an act, an attempt at persuasion by somebody else upon Jesus. And then the last point, and this is kind of a, now a counter argument, like you mentioned, one of the common objections to reading this account literally in inverted commas, at least as a, as a transactional dialogue and exchange uh, between two persons is that Matthew refers to a very high mountain that Jesus was taken up to and shown all the kingdoms of the world. Um, I, Luke doesn't mention a mountain, but he also says that um, the devil showed Jesus all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And it will be objected, of course, that there is no such a mountain that exists uh, where all the kingdoms of the world can literally be seen in one uh, moment of time. But I think this, this objection fails for a couple of reasons, not least because um, the, the account may be modeled after Deuteronomy 34, in which Moses ascends Mount Nebo, and God then showed him all the land that the Israelites were to receive. But if you look at commentaries on Deuteronomy, they will tell you that some of the places that Moses is said to have surveyed from the top of Mount Nebo, such as Zoar, are not actually visible from Mount Nebo. Um, and therefore, there is a kind of hyperbole taking place uh, when it says that Moses was able to see these places, he was sort of able to see in the direction of these places. So I think it's kind of over interpreting the text to say that uh, because Jesus was shown all the kingdoms of the world in a, from a, a very high mountain, that therefore Jesus literally had to be able to see like Portugal and Taiwan and, and all these other places from where he was perched on the mountain. Oh, no, that's a very good overview. Um, because I remember like uh, over, well over a decade ago when I started studying Christadelphianism or Christadelphia uh, theology, um, I was kind of struck like um, at how they would interact with say the um, wilderness temptation scenes. I do honestly believe it's one of the more difficult texts to explain in light of um, their theology of no, traditional external supernatural devil and i've read burke and heaster and andrew perry and others and um personally i think there's a lot of our special pleading going on but um i'm biased as is everyone but i think that's a very good overview like say some of the problems of the christadelphian interpretations um but also a good defense of the the traditional view that yes an external supernatural person even if you don't think it's the traditional devil did tempt jesus um and so forth. I think also some of the points you bring up, like say the uh, property transaction issue when it comes to Roman law, kind of refutes the idea that, and I think John Thomas in his commentary on Revelation Eureka was open to it, that this was a good angel from God's court who was trying to tempt Jesus and so forth. Um, I think that I think yeah, that was an interpretation he was open to as well. That doesn't make sense as well in light of uh, some of the issues you raise as well. So, um, yeah, and, and you know. Um, a number of biblical scholars 
um, ha have started using what's called narrative criticism over the past couple of decades. And I can think of one uh, particular example. I think it's Robert Brandon has a book called Satanic Conflict in, uh, in the Plot of Matthew, if I remember the title correctly. And he's basically using a narrative critical approach to interpret the figure of Satan. And, you know, that can be done in a sophisticated way by scholars. But the basic idea here is that the devil or Satan is, is a character in the gospel narrative. And so you have to read, you know, the temptation narratives alongside what the rest of these gospels say about this figure whom they repeatedly refer to as Ha Diabolos, the devil, and Ha Satanas, the Satan. Uh, because, you know, even in Matthew in Matthew and Luke's account, the devil is addressed by Jesus as Satan. Um, and it becomes pretty clear from all three synoptic gospels that the figure that's identified as Ha Satanas and or Ha Diabolos in the temptation narrative is not a good figure in the rest of the gospels you know in in matthew we have eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels um in in all three uh, synoptic gospels we have the account of the beelzebul controversy where the basic idea that jesus is arguing for is that particularly in matthew and luke in the q material that um the whole purpose of his of his mission is to um, counter this figure. And he tells the parable of the strong man in all three synoptic gospels where, you know, according to most interpreters, the strong man is, is Jesus. I mean, is, is the devil whom Jesus is uh, overcoming or binding in his, in his ministry. So yeah, you, you basically have to kind of isolate temptation narrative the, the figure of the devil in the temptation narrative from the rest of the gospels if you're going to argue that this is actually a good figure oh, that's good um maybe we're to like uh, maybe discuss the accommodation theory um that some christadelphians hold you not all christadelphians i know um the late harry whitaker was um very critical of the uh the accommodation theory in his studies in the gospel book um but Amongst these, uh, Duncan Easter and Jonathan Burke and a couple of other Christadelphians have written on it. Uh, they would argue that when it comes to, say, demon possession specifically, the language of accommodation or the language of the time was being used, but there's a form of um, deconstruction, subtle deconstruction on the behalf of the historical Jesus and the gospel writers. Um, now, you have a very good paper on this. Um, when an unclean spirit goes out of a person, um, so if anyone wants like a very good tarot um, interaction with this, um, I would suggest that. But what do you think are the problems of the accommodation theory as understood by Christadelphians? Because one that comes to mind is Christadelphians would actually hold a very conservative view of the Bible. Uh, the opening clause of the uh, Birmingham Amended Statement of Faith, and I'm sure for the unamended Statement of Faith, basically argues for a type of... Um, the Bible and the original autographs were without error, and if there's any error in the current manuscripts, it's because of human uh, error, like um, numbers and so forth. That's a um, very abbreviated view of the um, opening calls. So they would have officially a view very similar to, say, the Chicago Bay, uh, statement of uh, biblical inerrancy from the late, late 70s in some respects. So at least from my reading of the material, it would actually functionally go against this kind of very high view of biblical inspiration and authority that you have this kind of uh, subtle deconstruction of demonology and demon possession um, in the um, biblical texts. Um, uh, what do you think would be like some of the uh, problems of say the accommodation theory for demon possession and just uh, demon exorcism uh, in your view? Okay, well, you know, the first thing I would say without getting into any exegesis, but just looking at secondary literature, um, I think the sort of um, brand of Christadelphian apologetics that has become current in the past few decades um, with figures like 
the Burke brothers, Andrew Perry, and so on. One of the hallmarks of this approach to Christadelphian apologetics has been that there is a, a very strong appeal to scholarly literature. And in, in some cases, an apologetic argument is actually made that biblical scholarship is gravitating slowly but surely toward Christadelphian positions on many exegetical questions. And so if if the, the name of the game, you might say, is to um, seriously engage with biblical scholarship on its own terms and, and use that to, to aid in exegesis, then I think it, it has to be stated and recognized up front that in this particular case, um, the Christadelphian view has almost no standing in biblical scholarship. It's it's really um, something that had its heyday in the 1700s, which is where, um, you know, it, during the Enlightenment, you had increasing questioning of the supernatural view of the world uh, or the tendency to interpret illness and other phenomena uh, as potentially at least having supernatural causes or features uh, th that was happening that was being questioned in the enlightenment but the idea that the of biblical of challenging biblical inerrancy uh, was not yet gaining a lot of traction that that really came in the 19th century so there was this sort of period in the 18th century where a lot of <clears throat> interpreters uh, interpreters of scripture were not comfortable with the idea that you know demons could exist and that um, mental illnesses and and other psychosomatic phenomena could actually be caused by supernatural beings that idea was kind of on its way out but at the same time these writers we're not prepared to say that, you know, the New Testament writers were were wrong. And so they they really popularized this idea of accommodation. But that idea has subsequently kind of passed its sell-by date. And, you know, you if you read works on historical Jesus scholarship today, you will find people making the point that one of the most widely agreed historical facts about Jesus is that he was an exorcist because the evidence in the synoptic tradition is just overwhelming. That was the case. And, you know, I don't, there's, there's no reason for biblical scholars to, to question um, the idea and sort of to invent a fanciful interpretation, which is what I think the accommodation theory amounts to a very overcomplicated and uh, indirect way of interpreting these passages driven by a theological, I think, agenda that, you know, the notion of d demons actually existing is unacceptable. Today, most biblical scholars would be quite comfortable, I think, saying that, or many of them quite comfortable saying that the New Testament writers are simply mistaken in attributing some of these phenomena to transcendent causes. And so because they they don't have that theological axe to grind, you might say, okay, everyone has a theological axe to grind, we're all biased, but they don't have that particular theological axe to grind. So they are then sort of free to take the accounts at face value and say, yeah, um, Jesus thought that he was performing exorcisms. Um, the apostles thought that he and they were performing exorcisms and the new testament writers um told their readers that jesus and the apostles had performed exorcisms and that demon possession was a real phenomenon yeah in fact um so I, i'm sorry sorry to cut you off but like on page 44 of your article um you bring out something which i think is really good like um after quoting mark 9 38 to 40 where one of John the, uh, John the Baptist's disciples, he's engaged in exorcism and the apostles question Jesus about this. You know that here we have reference to someone who was apparently not a disciple of Jesus, but who was conducting exorcisms in his name. 
even if these alleged, albeit with no evidence, that Jesus had given his own disciples special instructions to the effect that demons weren't really demons and exorcisms weren't really exorcisms, which is the uh, Christadelphian view when they engage in this kind of uh, understanding of accommodation, it is highly unlikely that someone had received such instruction. It is virtually certain that this unknown exorcist believed in demons. In spite of this, Jesus not only endorsed the man's practice, but described it as a mighty work. This is very difficult to explain if Jesus sought only to accommodate belief in demons, and nigh impossible to explain if he sought to subvert belief in demons. So um, it, it's pretty clear, like at least in Mark's account, the Jesus uh, not only in, uh, allowed people to engage in exorcisms, but the assumption here is that demons had ontological or real existence, and they were engaging in exorcising uh, beings with ont ontological existence. Um, which is like one of the problems because no one doubts like scripture does use language of accommodation but there's not this kind of subversive accommodation where wink wink exorcisms aren't really real in the first second temple sense and wink wink demons don't have real existence it's just um a method of curing people of their Ill mental illnesses merely yeah and and just to to touch on your reference to the word subvert uh I think I highlighted it in the in the article, but you know, the traditional accommodation theory as was popular in the 1700s was what I would re would refer to as benign accommodation. In other words, the um, the gospel writers used accommodation because they were quite happy for their readers to believe in demons. Like they didn't see any any anything really seriously wrong with it but the subversive accommodation theory which uh, it basically is burke jonathan burke's view is that the gospel writers were actually using irony and other techniques to try to indirectly persuade their readers not to believe in demons so far from so it, it isn't really a true accommodation because they're actually using what seems to be accommodation to a hint there's a subtext by which the readers are supposed to understand that no we're actually not supposed to believe in these things and that that's like an extra layer of complication in terms of the interpretive approach um, and and that's why you know in the article just to very briefly outline or touch on some of the arguments against accommodation that i made i pointed out the lack the complete lack of clues indicating the verbal irony that is supposed to be present there, according to the subversive accommodation view. Um, I pointed out that there are, are distinctions made by the gospel writers between demonic and non-demonic cases, even when the symptoms displayed are similar in the account. Um, the, the, the continuity of the gospel accounts with other demonologies of the period and, and the exorcism techniques. The fact that the Gospels place theological significance on Jesus' exorcisms, particularly in the Beelzebul controversy, where, you know, Jesus actually says, if it is with the, the finger or the spirit of God, uh, one Gospel says finger, one says spirit, but if it is with the finger or spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And we know that, you know, the, the preaching of the kingdom of God was kind of the central teaching or message of Jesus in his ministry. So if he is um, hinging his entire message, uh, putting his entire message at stake on the idea that he is in fact casting out demons, then that shows that it's not sort of a, a throwaway um, uh, accidental couple of oblique references to a to a phenomenon that was current at the time it's something quite central to his message as portrayed by Matthew and Luke um yeah and then you know you have you have supernatural elements in the exorcism accounts like the demons jumping to some pigs I mean that that kind of thing is very difficult to explain if this is a psychological phenomenon yeah i know duncan um, easter tries to argue that this is only symbolic to give the person the assurance that they've been cured um that's one of his views but yeah 
yeah and, and but i think there's there's a, a both end there and one shouldn't dichotomize because very likely you know given the whole um jewish worldview around uncleanness and so on um it's very likely that there is an intended symbolism being conveyed by the event in, in the way that it's portrayed in the gospels but that's very different from saying that the event that's being described did not actually that they did not actually take place historically and or that the gospel writers didn't think didn't even think that it took place historically they are almost creating a parable out of it without with, without conveying that it actually happened whereas if you read the the account in its context it is presented as like any other of the events in the gospels something that actually happened and that jesus actually did yeah because i know andrew perry in one of his books argues this is a parable that tries to deconstruct the roman empire and stuff like that but again it's like both and like there could be and they could be using language like that but at the same time just using the historical graphical exegesis Jesus cast out demons and they went into a pig. Um, that's, but also like one text, and this came out during the Buzzard Burke debate uh, from two years ago, is how in Luke four, um, and which is historical narrative, not only is there demon exorcism, but Jesus actually talks to the demon and not to the formerly demonized man. And this comes out in the Greek where demon is neuter, man is masculine, and the Greek text shows he's in, uh, talking to some something or someone that's grammatically neuter, i.e. a demon. And that's in verses 33 to 35 and 40 to 41. And it's historical narrative. And there's no hint, uh, contra Burke and others, that this is just an accommodation. Um, uh, I, I Personally, I think that would be rather deceptive by the author of Luke, who I believe to be Luke, uh, if it was just simply accommodation without any qualification by the Lucan author, by Jesus, you know, um, I'm not sure if you think there's any way to that, but I think that's a very good argument shown that in Luke's historical narrative, Jesus, as he's presented, did believe demons and a demonized person were distinct indexicals or distinct entities as well. Yeah, certainly the the gospel writers, I think, present it that way, that they are distinct. Um, and, you know, I think sometimes uh, Christadelphians will point out that the the demon possessed and the demon sometimes are sort of referred to interchangeably in the in the narrative but that's i think that's to be expected when you have this very unusual phenomenon of possession because if you it, it's very clear why you if you're referring to a possessed individual um you could refer to that individual as the individual that they are in themselves or you could refer to them as they are as a possessed as the spirit that possesses them so that the distinction that would normally obtain between the clear distinction that would normally obtain between two personal beings becomes blurred uh, when one is possessing the other and therefore language runs up to, runs up against limitations to actually describe the phenomenon without kind of having some interchange. Um, the, the last exegetical argument that I went through in that article, uh, you alluded to part of it whereby Jesus permitted others to exercise, but Jesus also trained others to exer exercise and you know sent out the, his disciples to exercise. And that, that's very difficult to explain if, if Jesus was um, just trying to accommodate sort of a, a slowly dying idea uh, just tolerate it while it's on its way out. Uh, if if that's your view of the world, you're not going to actively train other people as exorcists. So, you know, I think on the whole, the the accommodation theory doesn't really carry any weight. Uh, any, you know, I I generally try to avoid overstating the case, but I really you know as i said in the beginning it has no standing in scholarship and i think for good reason yeah and uh it's a very good paper by the way and we don't have time to discuss it but you also interact with bill snowbillen's argument that um 
the further you go from like urban areas, the more demon possession, belief in demons, and the closer you come to like say more urban areas, the less belief in demons and demon possession takes place. We don't have time to flash that out, but it's one of the more sophisticated arguments I've come across, but there's a, a number of uh, problems and uh, with that view as well. Um, now, I know you only wanted to go for an hour because of time constraints an hour, but so uh, do you want to briefly discuss it or Jew 9 or Hebrews 2? I'll let you pick. Okay, maybe let's go with Hebrews. Okay, Hebrews uh, okay, no, that's fine. Um, Tom actually has a very good article in Jude uh, 9 that interacts with, say, Ron Abel and others on this. But when it, um, let's kind of go with Hebrews 2, 14, because this is often seen as like um, one of the best texts Christadelphians bring out to show that the devil is not this supernatural being. It's actually a personification of sin and one's sinful tendencies. And I'll quote from the NRSV. Uh, since, therefore, the children share flesh and blood, he, Christ, himself likewise shared the same things, so that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, or Diablos, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. And to quote a Christadelphian apologist, uh, Duncan Heaster, he argues that this verse states that the devil was destroyed by God, Christ's death. The Greek for destroy is translated abolish in Ephesians 2.15, and this would equate the devil with the enmity or fleshy mind, Romans 8, 7, generated by the Mosaic law. Uh, he writes a bit more on the real devil, but basically the TLD worries. Hebrew says uh, the devil was destroyed. You can't destroy the supernatural being, or at least until the eschaton, depending on your view of Satan. And of course, this here refers just like one's fleshy, sinful tendencies that was destroyed by the Christ event. Um, of course, I know you have a very good paper on uh, Satan in Hebrews, but perhaps if you were to give, like, say, some of the problems with this text, because in my experience, this is the go-to text in booklets and books and online presentations when Christadelphians positively defend their understanding of the devil. Okay. Um, so what the text actually says about the devil is that, A, through Christ's death, he might destroy him. Um, and B, he is the one who has the power of death. Um, now, the, the Greek verb katergeo, which is the verb translated um, destroy here um, and abolish elsewhere. Um, I don't have the dictionary definition from BDAG in front of me, but it has a semantic range that includes the idea of to render impotent, to render powerless. Uh, so it it does not automatically entail that the one who is the object of this verb kind of like ceases to exist or is completely annihilated. Um, and I, I think the in the argument of Hebrews, the um, the function of Jesus' death is primarily a legal one um you know there's a lot of interaction with the the old testament law and why its sacrifices could not you know ultimately they were a shadow they couldn't bring about the the salvation of the human race um but jesus death could and so jesus death ultimately um is about bringing about a legal change in situation for for humankind and therefore regardless whether we interpret the devil here as a transcendent being or as uh say a figurative reference to sin <laughs> either way it's perfectly consistent to view the destruction or the rendering impotent of this figure as being primarily legal um the the devil is somehow compromised or brought to naught in terms of his his power that's explicitly mentioned there of death over people and since all would agree that you know death has still continued after christ's death i think that also strengthens the notion that the the way in which uh, the destruction occurs is not definitive and consummate, but is primarily legal because 
Otherwise, if the passage says that the one who had the power of death has been consummately destroyed, then death itself should also not exist anymore. Um, now, the notion that um, the devil has the power of death, which is also the claim of this text, I think um, Christadelphians often try to build kind of a syllogistic argument where they will point to other passages in other parts of the New Testament that say, say in Romans 6, the wages of sin is death. And they'll say, sin is the is the entity that has the power of death. And therefore, if you make the equation, um, sin equals the devil. I don't, I don't think that argument works because it's... Um, you know, it's it's not a correct approach to biblical interpretation to kind of take different passages of different books and lump them together as if they're as if the New Testament is just one one big um, document. We have to interpret each text in its own context, um, and so it's not basically to find the illusion, the totality transfer, basically. Exactly. Yes. So. Um, the, the notion that the devil has the power of death is a bit is a bit of a puzzle, you might say. But we also have to explain why this term "ha diabolos" is used, because you know Hebrews generally regarded as having been written in the last two decades or so of the first century is written at a time when, on the on the evidence of the rest of the New Testament, "ha diabolos" is a well established term, technical term. And it refers to what we can call the devil, for lack of a better term. This this opponent and tempter that is described in, you know, I think about nineteen of the of the other New Testament uh, writings. Not not always by the term "ha diabolos," but by that and other terms. Um, the the other thing I would mention, and you know, you referred to my article on the devil in Hebrews, which I think was probably written more than a decade ago, and it was before I studied theology formally. So uh, maybe take it with a grain of salt. But in in uh, one of my uh, scholarly articles on the subject of the devil, which I co-authored with Dr. Guy Williams in the Journal for the Study of the New Testament called um, Diabolical Data, and that that the purpose of that article was to basically identify every reference to the devil in the New Testament. And we made the argument there that there is a second reference to the devil in, in the book of Hebrews, which is, you know, not, I wouldn't say that it's, it's widely recognized by scholars and commentators on Hebrews, but we are by no means the only, the only ones to think that such a reference exists. And that's in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 28 which refers to, it, it says um, about Moses, by faith he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. Now, there's also a reference to the destroyer in 1 Corinthians 10. And in 1 Corinthians 5, um, Paul speaks of, regarding the person that was guilty of incest, Deliver such a person to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. That those are Paul's words, and then later on he refers to the destroyer in, you know, in the Old Testament context. So there is this notion in one Corinthians that one of Satan's functions is as a destroyer, and at the same time there is a link made to the Old Testament, this figure of the destroyer from the Old Testament, and so there is already a potential parallel in the New Testament itself, not by the same author, but to the idea that the destroyer in the um, in the Exodus narrative is being interpreted by these early Christian writers as actually identical with the figure that they know as Satan. Uh, I won't go through the whole argument of why we reach the conclusion in Hebrews 11, 28, that this figure of the destroyer is again regarded by the writer as identical with the devil but um if we were to 
accept that view or even say regard it as plausible, it's quite clear that the the destroyer is one who has the power of death within the Exodus narrative. That's basically his his function, you know, destroying the firstborn, bringing about their deaths in Egypt. So within the same book, we potentially have some corroboration of the idea that um, the devil could, as a transcendent figure, have in some sense um, the power of death over human over the human race. And even as um, in the Passover narrative, the destroyer is restrained through the blood that is put on the lintels of the, the Hebrews' households, the devil is restrained from exercising that power um, of death over the, the Hebrews' firstborns. So also through the blood of Christ uh, in, in chapter 2, the devil is destroyed in the sense that his power of death over the human race is is legally nullified. No, that's very good. Um, and also, like in the intertestamental literature, like the Testament of Abraham and some other volumes, an external supernatural being has the control or dominion of death as well. Um, so it, it would be like very unusual if this was simply a personification that was being destroyed and so forth. Um, but uh, everyone should check out the article you co-authored with Williams. Uh, there's a lot of uh, interesting information there. Uh, I know you have like time constraints, so like we can end it there. But like again, let me just say, really do appreciate you coming on to this podcast. Um, as I said, it's kind of unusual um, a Catholic former Christadelphian coming on to a Mormon podcast, but I really do appreciate it. I'm sure there's a joke in there somewhere. But um, as I said in the show notes, I'll include your uh, the link to your website, your blog, your Academia Edu website. And also to Swanstone's intellectual Catholicism, where you've appeared a few times. Um, also, because we've mentioned Jonathan Burke, um, if he ever watches this and ever if he ever wants to come on to give like a Christadelphian defense of Satan and demons, I would welcome it. Uh, scripturalmormonism at gmail.com. I'm not sure if you'll ever watch this, but just in case. Um, but yeah, um, but would, is there any like other sources you would recommend like if someone wants to delve more into like say satanology and demonology is there any like uh, apart from your material is there any like good source uh, that you would suggest um i would just say maybe if you if you look at some of my scholarly writings and just go to the bibliography or the the references cited in there um they're they're pretty they're pretty extensively cited, and I think there are a lot of good sources that I relied on, and so others can also benefit from those. Um, and yeah, I, I think um, I, for the sake of avoiding a duplication or repetition, I didn't give some of the arguments that I gave when I appeared on Swan Sona's podcast, Intellectual Catholicism, talking about, uh, I think it was only about Satan, I don't think we really got into demons. But I think um, some of the arguments that I made there, I, I spoke a, at length about Second Temple Judaism, Second, Second Temple Jewish texts, and how the the notion of this um, transcendent, leading transcendent opponent um, develops from the Hebrew Bible through to the New Testament. And so I would encourage Christadelphians and any other Christadelphians, Mormons, Catholics, anyone under the sun who's interested in these things to to check out that podcast as well I, I just could mention um i also watched the debate between jonathan burke and anthony buzzard a couple of years ago and uh one thing that i, I think i tried to ask it as a question at the end but i don't i don't remember if it was taken or taken it was or but maybe... i don't think they understood the nuance of what you were asking yeah, that, that was my sense as well. So I was basically highlighting that both, and, and I think this is a major argument that Christadelphians need to contend with and that I didn't properly understand when I was a Christadelphian, that both of the key, most frequent terms for the devil that are used in the New Testament, ha satanas and ha diabolos, take their origin from the Old Testament. Um, ha satanas is, of course, a transliteration of satan the hebrew word satan or perhaps the aramaic satana um 
and so it takes its origin from the from that hebrew aramaic term which as we know is used in the old testament in the hebrew bible and most significantly in the prologue of job and in zechariah 3 where it occurs with the definite article and secondly ha diabolos perhaps lesser known to many um is the is the usual translation of ha satan satan with the definite article or satan with the definite article in the hebrew bible in the septuagint so in job one and two in the septuagint which is the ancient greek translation of the hebrew bible that you know was translated before the time of christ in job one and two and in zechariah three um ha satan is translated as ha diabolos and so um you know we know that the septuagint was used liturgically in the early church it was the the bible that was read aloud at the the worship meetings and so they would have heard about this figure ha diabolos uh, whenever job or zechariah 3 came up in the readings and so that should be our starting point for trying to understand uh, this figure that we encounter in the gospels who is not really properly introduced or defined because the writers kind of assume that the readers know what he's talking about. And so I think where, in my experience, Christadelphians kind of bracket out um, the, the material in the Old Testament, in, in Job 1 and 2 and in Zechariah 3, as almost having nothing to do with, um, with Satan and the devil in the New Testament, except perhaps uh, having, in a, by a, a very indirect means, lent the term satan to the the new testament but not really the concept uh, i think if we if we really dig into the the linguistic and lexical relationships there it becomes clear that we have to contend with job 1 and 2 and zechariah 3 in interpreting the new testament devil yeah and what's interesting is like uh these figures um in job and zechariah they're heavenly figures um and out of that according like many scholars developed the traditional view of satan but whatever they were they weren't like simply members of the congregation of faith they were clearly like heavenly supernatural beings in some sense yeah that's correct the the standard scholarly interpretation of both job one and two and zechariah three is that um Hasatan is a figure, is a member of the divine council or the heavenly council. Um, whereas I think most Christadelphians argue that it's a human figure. Yeah, that's that Roman really have... view and rest in scriptures. Yeah. yeah. So that, that view again doesn't really have currency in scholarship. In uh in in one Chronicles 21 1, the, the figure that's called Satan there, which is without definite article. Um, in that case, there's kind of a debate among biblical scholars whether that figure is transcendent or human. So it's it's not as clear cut. But in Job 1 and 2 and Zechariah 3, I mean, it, there's an overwhelming scholarly consensus that this figure is a transcendent figure uh, from the heavenly council. No, that's uh, no, that's perfect. Um, as I said, like really do appreciate the information. Um, and of course, everyone should check out your link to your articles and your blog posts, including the peer reviewed material for like more information. But uh, as I said, Tom, really do appreciate you coming on. Um, and um, all the best with your uh, forthcoming endeavors, both as a stat uh, in statistics as well as hopefully more material in uh, biblical theology and the like. Um, so keep it up. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I really uh, appreciate the invitation come on and I enjoyed our conversation. Same here. Um, thank you.